It ain't the left side or the right side, and it must be the fence side. Inside. It ain't the left side, side. or the right side. Welcome to another episode of On the Fence Side. You can follow us on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, on iTunes, or with the hashtag FinsideQ. Paul, uh, as we get ready here for the Dolphin Seahawks matchup, uh, a lot of interesting things happened this, this past week. First, Donna Ponte. No longer with the Miami Dolphins. She is pursuing one of Steve Ross's organizations, RSE Ventures. You know, it seems like the Dolph- Dolphins fans, a lot of them at least, have had a lot of unjustified disdain for Donna Ponte. And I, I have an idea as to why, but uh, w- what do you think? Yeah, I mean, she did at one point in time get into an area that obviously wasn't her forte and quickly got removed from that area. Unfortunately, not quickly enough. But outside of that, she's been one of the best capologists one of the best contract negotiators. We don't see scenarios like they have out in San Diego, which are brutal in terms of contract negotiations. She's, she's done a very good job overall in terms of keeping this team out of cap hell, which is very interesting. Contracts will go with, to say the least. So it is a loss for this organization. I'm not sure who's stepping into that role as it stands right now, but she's actually a lot better than people gave her credit for at certain behind-the-scenes things, not so much in some of the day-to-day football aspects that she started to dabble with at one point. Yeah, I mean, I I always thought she was good at her job, and I wish her the best. I mean, her job is to be a capologist, and I thought she worked very well with Jeff Ireland in terms of the forward thinking. wouldn't surprise me if she and Mike Tannenbaum really didn't have the same camaraderie that she and Jeff Ireland had. Mike Tannenbaum swings for the fences. He prioritizes quantity over quality, which we'll get to a little little bit later. wouldn't surprise me if there was a difference of opinion there. Uh, In other NFL news, big news of, the, of this past weekend, Sam Bradford traded from the Philadelphia Eagles to the Minnesota Vikings for a first and fourth round pick. Paul, your thoughts? It's a steep price to pay for Sam Bradford, but if you look at pro football focus, Sam Bradford was actually rated higher than Teddy Bridgewater last season, and Let's face it, with Sean Hill in there, quarterback, the Vikings were not going anywhere this season whatsoever. With Sam Bradford in there, with the top rushing attack they have in Minnesota, with some of that weight taken off his shoulders, with the fact that he may not be taking as many big hits, the Vikings suddenly went, in the course of two or three days, from completely relevant in the NFC playoff picture to completely irrelevant in the playoff picture, back to complete and total relevance. And there are some reports flying around, founded or unfounded, that Teddy Bridgewater's injury may be even more serious than we've all had reported to us, in which case the Bradford trade makes even more sense. So it could turn into two first-round picks if Minnesota wins the Super Bowl. So there is a sliding scale on that fourth-round pick as well based on how they perform and how much of that is Sam Bradford having playing time. So it's a good move. Gets Carson Wentz into the driver's seat up there in Philly a little earlier than expected. But it's a win-win for both teams. I'm really disappointed in Philadelphia that Chase Daniel was not given that starting job. They signed him to three and a half million a year, and ever since he came out of Mizzou, which I am a fan of, I I think every opportunity Chase Daniel ha- has shined. And even though he's a little bit on the small side, it's you know six foot, two hundred twenty pounds. Uh, I, I think he gets the ball out of his hands quickly, has that overhanded release, can throw over those big offensive linemen, and has some mobility. I, I thought it'd be better for Carson Wentz to sit on the bench for, bench for a year out of North Dakota State. You know, Sam Bradford. Uh, I have always said that for the last several years, I, I don't know what the big deal is about this guy. Looking back to 2008, 2008, Barack Obama's first term as president. This was the last time he even played well in football in college he was he missed the two most of the 2009 season and ever since he's coming to the nfl i have never rated him higher than 24th or 25th among all 32 quarterbacks in the league if it were anybody but the vikings i i think you need to be checked into a mental hospital but yeah the vikings are a team when you look at the rest of the roster adrian peterson at running back the offensive line is looks good their defense on all three levels defensive line linebacker defensive back really ready you could argue to make a Super Bowl run if they just have that quarterback position. And yeah, Sean Hill, 
you're not winning seven more than seven or eight games with him a quarterback. Bradford is at least better than him, but still a steep price to pay. We'll see what happens. And other news, uh, linebacker Chris McCain, who the Dolphins traded a couple of weeks ago to the New Orleans Saints for a conditional seventh rounder. They will not get that seventh rounder now because he did not make the 53-man roster. One thing that really stuck out to me, and we're looking around the NFL, specifically on our own division, Breno Giacomini, the Jets' right tackle, placed on injured reserve, goes down for the year. So, Paul, now, when you look at the Bills, Jets, and Patriots right tackles, you have it with the Patriots. Keep in mind, the right tackle is is the position that's going to go up against Cameron Wake on third down and in fourth quarters of games. You have Sebastian Vollmer, who's going to be at least out for the first six games, replaced by Anthony Cannon, who's who's a career backup. With Buffalo, you have Chantrell Henderson, who is really iffy to start the season. He had Crohn's disease in the offseason. You have Jordan Mills starting a right tackle for the Bills. And if that name sounds familiar, it's because Cameron Wake destroyed him two years ago in Chicago uh, for two and a half sacks. And uh, taking Breno Giacomini's place at right tackle with the New York Judge is Ben Ijalana, a former second-round pick that I'm surprised is still in the league. I mean, you've got to think for Cameron Wake, this is – He's foaming at the mouth at this point. Well, not just that. The fact that he's facing these backups. He's going to be facing these backups fresh, given the way that they're going to utilize him, which is something I know you and I have hoped for, not just this preseason, but over the past couple seasons, that Miami would start truly transitioning Cam Wade into that pass rush specialist role, like you see with Dwight Freeman and some of the other guys that are getting up there in age. Having a fresh Cam Wade going against a backup right tackle that's out there every down, that's getting worn down by guys like Jason Jones and Andre Branch and possibly occasionally a stunting and Dominican Sue. I'm happy as hell to hear about that. I can't wait to see how Cam Wake does against the Patriots in week two. I only wish Brady was out on the field for that just because I'd love to see Cam Wake really have a clear path to Brady down in and down out. And I'm excited to see what, what can happen with that scenario going on around the AFC East. It's only good news for the Dolphins. Looking at the Dolphins' 53-man roster, which we'll get into in a second, Paul, uh, around the NFL, obviously every team had to get down to that 53-man roster. What were some moves or a move that really surprised you? I was actually pretty surprised, and I know there were several people I've seen out on Twitter and social media that have said the same, but given the coverage that we've had around him throughout the preseason and even at the end of last season, I was pretty surprised that Shamil Gary got caught. The fact that Miami only kept nine defensive backs, I, I think we may see that number go up once Isaiah Pete is healthy, once Demonte Parker is healthy. Some of these other guys get healthy and are able to get back on the field and they won't keep as bloated of numbers. I think they've got some decisions to make at tight end, but I think we could see Shamil Gary come back because, let's face it, he's a guy that did a lot of special things. Even if he didn't look special until all of a sudden it was like, wait, oh, he's right there and he made the play. Holy crap. So I was really disappointed to see him get caught, just just because I really like the play and I really like his upside. Yeah, Shamil Gary actually was signed to the Vikings practice squad, which means if the Dolphins do want him, they can't sign him to their active roster. But, yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I expected Shamil Gary to make the roster. Um, you know, th- there weren't a whole lot of other surprises for me among the Dolphins' 53-man roster. We'll go through those and, and go through the, the finer points of that. Around the NFL, Josh Sitton, uh, the – four-time Pro Bowl guard for the Green Bay Packers. Cut was signed by the Chicago Bears. Yeah, I, I didn't expect the Dolphins to sign him. I mean, it, I, I don't think it's worth have putting the resources into that position. And, you know, you, you can't just grab everybody that's on the free agent market. And the Dolphins look like they have a pretty decent tandem there, right guard, in Bushrod and Billy Turner. Between those two, I think they're going to result in at least one good player. So let's go position by position, Paul, as you see what really stuck out for us. Not a surprise, uh, at least for me, Ryan Tannehill, Matt Moore make the roster. I, I thought they were as, as close to locks as you can get. And Dolphins faced a really tough decision with Brandon Dowdy and Zach Dysart ended up taking Brandon Dowdy and keeping him on the 53. Um, would you, are you happy with that, Paul, or would you have preferred Dysart? I'm happy with Dowdy being on there. I'm a little disappointed, even though I understand it, that they kept Matt Moore still. I thought it was time to part ways a couple of years ago, even though I, I like and respect the human being that is Matt Moore. I, I just... And I think they finally got the opportunity to do so this preseason, given the play of Bowdy, given the play of Dicer, even if they wanted to keep three quarterbacks. But, you know, it, it, I just don't see him that more gives that chance to win if he comes in in most scenarios anymore. 
his old gambling style um, might have gotten him there a couple of times here and there back when he was slightly below average with a chip on his shoulder. At this point, his skills have deteriorated enough that as a placeholder quarterback for a few games, uh, it's a scary idea. And let's hope that that offensive line can continue to keep Tannehill clean in the regular season. Yeah, I mean, I never agreed with you on this. Uh, Matt Moore, I always felt, was making the final roster. Uh, I agree with you on Matt Moore that uh, he's a quarterback. I don't think the Dolphins should have re-signed as many times as they did, but he, they did re-sign and they fully guaranteed his contract. And I, I would much rather have Matt Moore back there as opposed to Brandon Dowdy and Zach Dyson. Frankly, I think both of them are bad. I, you know, I, I don't see the upside in Dowdy that a lot of other people do. I think he's a step slow for everything. I think he lacks physical arm talent. I, I, and that's the type of player that I want as a third quarterback, somebody who I think, okay, if he just does this more effectively, then he's going to be really good. Looking at the running back position, the Dolphins did decide to keep five backs. Arian Foster, Jay Ajayi, Isaiah Pede, Kenyon Drake, and Damian Williams. You know, Damian Williams is really the one that sticks out, a player that I think has hung on a little bit too long, maybe the Matt Moore of the running back spot. Do you expect Damian Williams to get cut when Isaiah Pede returns to full health? I think there's a very strong possibility. I think once they get a little more comfortable with Kenyon Drake returning kicks after they get see him out there a little bit more, once Isaiah Pede returns to full health, Damian Williams could be with him for conditional pick somewhere, whether they cut him outright. Uh, I, I don't think Miami carries five running backs throughout the entire season. And Damian Williams would be that man out at this point. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Uh, as Isaiah Pede, uh, to me, is clear-cut the second-best running back on the roster. I look forward to him coming back. I am not a JHIA fan at this point anymore. I think this guy is just flat-out slow. Other than maybe being a bell cow in the fourth quarter wearing down defenses, I, I'm not a big fan of the guy. I mean, a, power doesn't do a whole heck of a lot of good for you when you're not fast enough to get out of the backfield. Uh, and Ajayi is not quick getting out of the backfield. I think Isaiah Peed looks the part. Arian Foster looks the part. Kenyon Drake, based on at least physical attributes, looks the part. Damian Williams, Jay Ajayi, I can't get on board with. But I, I do expect Ajayi to be on the team this year and probably next year, too. The wide receiver spot, Paul, a little bit of, of, of churning here. We're not surprised at the first five. Jarvis Landry, Parker, Kenny Stills, Leontay Carew, and Jakeem Grant. The, the sixth receiver initially that was kept was Griff Whalen, but his, his stay was really short-lived when the Dolphins signed wide receiver Justin Turner and cut Griff Whalen. What do you make of that move as the sixth receiver? I definitely think Justin Hunter is an upgrade. Griff Whalen was a guy that I never saw the, saw the allure of. Yeah, he was a guy that when he got in against the sixes and sevens in the preseason, tended to shine a little bit, but when he got in against the twos and threes, completely disappeared. He's going to disappear against the twos and threes. He's probably not going to think be facing a two or three when he gets on the field during the regular season. He's going to be facing the ones. And at that point in time, he's disappearing into twos and threes. He's not going to do anything against the ones. So I didn't see the, the allure of keeping Griff to begin with, other than, you know, a little cult following based on what he did against the sixes and sevens. Yeah, and you look at Griff Whalen against Justin Hunter. Talk about two players from the opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, Justin Hunter just, gosh, a couple of years ago was the 34th overall pick of the NFL draft. Almost won the first round. Uh, tall, fast, but has never put it together, even dating back to his final year at Tennessee. Uh, was a disappointment for the Titans. And then, on the other hand, you've got Griff Whalen, who's an overachiever, undrafted, five foot 190-pound receiver out of Stanford, who really scratched and clawed his way to a 53-man roster spot. But I'm with you, Paul. I, I didn't see the what was advantageous about keeping Griff Whalen. Uh, I, I didn't think he was a developable player. I thought he and Damian Williams, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to keep. But he, Justin Hunter now looking at him, if, if you hit it, you really hit it big on him. Looking at the tight end spot, moving on, Jordan Cameron, Deion Sims, not a surprise that they make that, uh, that final roster. But, you know, it, it was really looking like a, a an interesting battle for that third tight end spot with Thomas Duarte, Dominique Jones, and Mark He's great. I actually, in my final roster prediction on FinFans on, on Facebook, the, the website that I moderate, actually had Duarte and Dominique Jones making the team and keeping four tight ends, and Marquise Gray getting cut. What do you make of Gray making the final roster? Duarte didn't really show anything special, unfortunately. It showed that he had a lot of development to, to go in terms of his conversion from being a wide receiver to being a tight end. 
His blocking was completely suspect. And let's face it, it it's, the tight end position was an absolute mess throughout the preseason. Gray looked decent at times, and decent is far better than what we saw out of our starter in Jordan and Cameron. I wouldn't be surprised if Deion Sims is on the field more than Cameron by the third or fourth week because we saw Ryan Tannehill not have faith in, in, in Jordan and Cameron in that third and penultimate preseason game when he pulled and refused to throw to him at one point. I'm just disturbed by our tight end situation right now. I think Miami still needs to be scouring waiver wires out there and seeing what they can get. I know they can't really effectively part ways with Cameron this year, but I think after this season, it's time for him to go. Yeah, me too. And Marquise Gray makes the final 53-man roster. Played really well in his final appearance against the Tennessee Titans on, on September 1st. And I think the biggest thing that does it is Gray has a little more special teams ability. He's stronger. He's sturdier. And you can bet that missed block by Thomas Duarte against the Dallas Cowboys uh, that, that led to Matt Tarr almost getting hurt, uh, stuck out fresh in their minds. Luckily, Duarte is back on the practice squad. He needs to drink some milk. He's got to put on some pounds, and hopefully he starts to contribute uh, in 2017. The offensive line, Paul, there's a lot of moving parts. Taking a look, you've got obviously the starters. You've got Juwan James, Brandon Albert, Laramie Tunzel, Mike Pouncey, Jermon Bushrod, and other locks were Billy Turner, Dallas Thomas, and Anthony Steen. Craig Urbic wins that ninth offensive lineman spot. Uh, over a few other players like Ulrich John. A surprise for you, or did you expect that? Uh, I kind of expected that, given the fact that Pouncey was hurt. They need somebody that can step in and play center. They don't have the confidence in Jameel Douglas, who they did actually, much to my surprise, bring back on the practice squad. They needed somebody that could play backup center with Pouncey out for a little bit. We'll go with because we don't really have an exact time frame. So they needed somebody that can come in and reliably back up Steen at center. And that was Urbic. So that made him the natural selection there for that final spot. Yeah, and uh, Urbic, I, it'll be interesting to see if when Pouncey returns and Steen, you think, goes back to that backup center role. Craig Urbic, uh, is his spot safe on the Dolphins' 53-man roster? I don't know. Uh, we'll see. Looking at the defensive side of the ball, you've got the locks on the defensive line. Wake, Sue, Mario Williams, Earl Mitchell, Branch, Jason Jones, Jordan Phillips. And then it was interesting for the final two spots. They went to Terrence Fade and Julius Wormsley. I'm ecstatic that Julius Wormsley made this team. He was a guy that no matter who he got on the field against, uh, no matter how rough some of the backup defensive line was playing, and I'm looking at Chris Jones here, who I know doesn't have a job anymore, so I won't say too, too much on it, um, and a host of others. Wormsley was a guy that even when things looked bleak this preseason, was shy and got into that backfield regardless, took on his blockers. And he's really getting that little cult following, and I hope he's not inactive on game days very often because I'd like to see him get some time on the field. And he may even, if he continues to build off of that, be what lets the Dolphins walk away from Earl Mitchell next year, which I know will make you a little happy with that. Oh, it sure will. And Julius Wormsley, I'm glad he made the final roster. Brings a different type of defensive tackle. 6'2", 270 to 275 pounds. Uh, can really rush the passer from the inside. And the Dolphins really haven't had a guy like that uh, that can come off the bench. Terrence Fade, I was hoping Clayon Lang was actually going to make the team over him. But luckily, the Dolphins got a best, the best of both worlds because Lang ended up making the Dolphins practice squad. I hope that he can continue to stay there and just continue to develop because in the third and fourth preseason games, I thought Lang and, and Wormsley were throwing around everybody, and even if it was against second, third, and fourth teamers. The linebacker spot, uh, not a surprise. Jenkins, Alonzo, Mies. The Hewitt Spencer Pacinger make the final roster. It was really a matter of do the Dolphins keep a sixth linebacker? They did, and Mike Hall over a few other players like James Burgess, who is on the practice squad, and James Michael Johnson. Paul, Mike Hall, I know you've always been a bigger fan of than me. Are, are you glad that he's the sixth guy? I'm glad he's there mainly for his special teams prowess. And it could get really interesting a few weeks when Zach Vigil's able to come off the TUT list because. Either Pace Singer or Hull is going to be the one to go at that point. And both of them are going to have to really take advantage of every opportunity on special teams to be out there and, and bang some heads and try to get that final spot because that final spot is in jeopardy around week six or seven. Yeah, I, I'm a little disappointed that Hull made the roster and they haven't cut him and signed another linebacker who may have more down-to-down -down ability. But Mike Hull is a big fan. and he, he has a lot of fans in the locker room good special teams player, so we'll see what happens. And then 
finally looking at, at the secondary, by far the Dolphins' scariest spot on the team. You, you had the obvious locks, uh, Byron Maxwell, Tony Lippett, Bobby McCain, Rashad Jones, IAQ, Walt Aikens, Xavier Howard, and I thought Michael Thomas was a lock too. And then finally the ninth roster spot went to Jordan Lucas, and they only kept nine defensive backs. I expected them to stockpile a few more, especially after the other cuts were made. Paul, uh, what do you think? Yeah, and, and I know I touched on this earlier, so I won't beat it to death, but I think the secondary is where once they get a few of these guys back healthy, when Chris Culliver comes back, that'll bring it up a little bit. When Isaiah Pete and some of these guys in other positions come back, you may see the secondary be where they add a couple of players. So it could be yeah. some interesting moves with that. Yeah, hey, I'll tell you, a few, a few players to keep an eye on. And, uh, I, I think they're still out there. Uh, Doran Grant, a former fourth rounder from the Steelers who was cut, uh, I think he landed back on the practice squad. And then Nick Marshall, the cornerback and former Auburn quarterback, who I think at least has a lot of developmental talent uh, if, if a team is going to be patient with them. So keep an eye on them and a few other players out there on the free agent market. Now, Kat, did Tier the Spears sign anywhere yet, or is he still out there as well? You know, I think he did uh, sign somewhere, and I'm t- and and here's the thing: I, I'm actually people say Lindenwood. What the heck is Lindenwood University? Uh, well, actually, I am a Lindenwood graduate here in St. Charles, Missouri, and he was the first player drafted in uh, the fourth round by the Browns a little while ago. He actually did sign. He signed with the San Diego Chargers. Uh, not a big surprise. I know Ian Wharton was a, was a pretty big fan of him. I was surprised that the Browns, after trading Justin Gilbert and Juwan Williams being suspended and then being cut eventually, uh, I'm surprised that they didn't keep him on their on their roster. But hey, they've been axing a lot of players in Cleveland. Third, they drafted. 14 players this year. 13 of them made the final roster as rookies. So, interesting situation going out there in Cleveland. And so, Paul, looking around the, the NFL, is there is there anybody that was cut from the 53-man roster that you have an eye on or did have an eye on at the time they were cut? One guy I looked at briefly was, was Jake Samaro, and I actually reached out because I know when a couple of years ago when he got drafted, he was a guy that I liked a lot, and I think he liked even more than I did. And he was pretty promising as a rookie before getting injured. And then he came back last season, was kind of up and down with the injuries, and this preseason looked absolutely atrocious. And I hadn't watched the Jets too much, so I reached out to uh, Jeff Floyd, who we've had on the show a couple of times, and basically was shocked that even though the Jets don't have a real answer at tight end, they went ahead and cut him anyway because he was just that bad. So finding that out, I know a lot of folks are like, oh my God, Jason Barr was available. Nobody wants him. I know he signed with the Titans at this point. He didn't look good, didn't look special, looked slow, confused, and atrocious out there. And we've already got Jordan Cameron. Let's not add to that pile. Yeah, I'm one of those who liked Amar coming out of Texas Tech. I, I thought he was going to emerge into a, an NFL star. And one thing about him is he, he didn't have the best hands at Texas Tech, but I thought he could, with a positional coach, could overcome that. But he has bad hands and he had a bad attitude, and it, that's not a good combination. So maybe he'll turn around in Tennessee, but these players typically with that combination of tight end do not turn it around. Paul, that's going to do it for us here on the Fin Side on this special episode, breaking down the 53-man roster. Follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, on iTunes, and as well as with the hashtag FinSideQ. And remember, if it's not on the left side and it's not on the right side, it is on the Fin Side. Solo D, take us home. It ain't the left side or the right side, and it must be the Fin Side. It ain't the left side, left side or the right, right side, and right it must be the fifth left. Listen, Dolphins fans across the land all tuning in To see what Brian, Cat, and Paul about to do again We rep our team, you can't change, stop or ruin it All we need is to figure what to do to win Fans radio, live and direct Win or lose, we showing up for every contest No puppet talk, it's all raw and unfiltered Voice of the fans when the season looks peculiar Rock an apple orange over here, then you familiar Every week they come and do our speakers to fulfill the crap we have to hear about our team and all the latest news. Vets, the rookies trying to make the team paying dues. Current players and alumni interviews. City to city, state to state, follow the moves. Call the hotline, Dolphins talk, set to go. Best sports team and show all across the globe.